Great Writers Media. I'm Logan Crawford, and right now on Spotlight TV, we dive into the courageous story of Carly Reed in Human Behind the Mask. This memoir is not just a narrative, it's a beacon of hope, chronicling the author's 14-year battle with addiction, body dysmorphia, and mental health challenges. Through a unique blend of poetry, personal insights, and scripture, complemented by custom-painted artwork, the author offers inspiration and guidance to those on their own path of recovery. Join us as we explore the depths of spiritual growth and the power of transformation. We're delighted to have this very talented author join us here today on Spotlight. We thank our team at Great Writers Media for helping us put her in the spotlight today. And we ask viewers like you to support writers like her by subscribing to our channel and by purchasing her wonderful book. The links are below this interview. Carly, great to see you here today on Spotlight. Thank you so much for having me. It's nice to see you too. My pleasure. Loved your book. I think it's an important work. I think it's a powerful work. It's impactful. But let's start with the title, Human Behind the Mask. What do you mean by that? Wow, that's a really good question. So basically, um, whether it was addiction or body dysmorphia or a mental disorder, it was always a mask. And so when I got sober and started to recover, I broke it down to being like, wow, I'm just a human and I'm putting on all these masks to face the world. So when I started to embrace myself for who I was as I was in recovery and I stopped trying to cover everything up and was just able to be honest with myself, I realized that I wore a lot of masks throughout those years. Mm. And so therefore I called it human behind the mask because at the end of the day, we're all just human beings, no matter what mask we put on or to face the world or to make life easier or what substance, you know, because even if you're altering your mind in order to do things or just to numb things like that's, a you know, that's wearing a mask. And yeah. so basically in recovery, what I did was I took off all my masks in order to properly try to recover and focus on recovery. And that was really, really hard to do. So I called it human behind the mask because I want people to be able to embrace themselves as human, just human beings, not any, not putting any fronts or facades or masks on. Because a lot of it is the pressure to be perfect, to look perfect, to be perfect, to please people, to be funny, to be on, right? Isn't that a big part of addiction, particularly when it extends to body dysmorphia and so forth? Exactly. And um, the biggest part of addiction, which is also why I called it human behind the mask, is because when you take a mask off, you're facing, you know, you're usually facing something without a barrier. Mm -hmm. And um, something that really, for me, that I thought was really cool was, uh, and my advice for people and why I called it human behind the mask is because I realized in recovery, you have to face it and embrace it. Mm -hmm. Meaning like, there's oh there's an underlying factor as to what's going on what prompt what's prompting this addiction why am i why do i have these urges to use why do i have these urges you know all the, all of those things there's something underlying there and once you take the mask off you're able to on- face it with honesty but mm-hmm. if you're you know if you're trying to face something that's amping up your addiction and you have a mask on you're not able to really solve the problem so that was facing it and embracing it. And that was really my message for the human mask. Well, it's a great way to phrase it and uh, kind of sticks with you. Tell us a little bit about your story. At what age do you feel like you were going off the rails or went off the rails a little bit? As soon as I got my hands on substances um, mm. and I started as a teenager, I think just you know, pure innocence, being in high school and just experience or not experience, experimenting. And then that led to experimenting for me led to a lot of enjoyment. I found a lot of enjoyment in substances and the way it made me feel, the way it took away my anxiety, the way Mm -hmm. I could socialize better. And so all of that sort of played a role in amping it up. And then it just, I feel like it really got amped up when I went away to college. Um, and then, you know, so that definitely had played a big role. And again, in my mind, I was, I knew, always knew in the back of my head, like this, this is a problem because I liked it too much. Right. 
Yeah, it's funny. Uh, I listened to Rob Lowe. He has a podcast and uh, he was also, he's been sober now for years, decades. But he said, you know, the, the, the reason why he was abusing alcohol and drugs is because it was so much fun, you know? Mm -hmm. It's just like, I don't drink anymore. I'm sober. I, I haven't had a drink in about four years. And wow, I, do I miss amazing. drinking? I do. I mean, it was fun. Yeah. Yeah. You know, yeah. Did I, do I miss the headaches or do I miss, you know, everything else I went with it? No. But uh, yeah, that's the thing about substances. Unfortunately, they are fun. And that's mm -hmm. why they are easily abused. And if people don't understand that, like, you know, they're saying, oh, how could you do that? It's fun, you know, but yeah. but like you said, after a while, you realize you like it too much. You know, you're not just having a glass of wine. That's what I said. There was a, a reason to have a drink at every occasion. Because I go yeah. out to eat all the, I go out to lunch, let's have a glass of wine. Dinner, let's have some wine. Let's have an after dinner cocktail. You know, it's it's nonstop and it's not healthy after a while. Tell us about your recovery. Um, when you went into rehab, um, was it a 30 day program, that 28 day program, that kind of thing? Or tell us about that. Yeah, I went into a three month outpatient program. Um, and that was uh, after so I had I basically went into recovery when I realized like I was hitting rock bottom, which think I'm so grateful that I was able to ask for help. Because that was the biggest part of getting of, of the, getting the help that I needed. I um so what pushed me to into my recovery was I lost my house. It was a very short time span, but I lost my house in the hurricane, mm -hmm. Hurricane Ian. And then I had I was in a uh, relationship that ended in that very short time span. And so all, I was surrounded by a lot of loss, like, and um, that forced me it it pushed me down a downward spiral, yeah. which then forced me to get help because I had already had a problem before the hurricane, before the breakup, I had pro a problem with my addiction. There wasn't, you know, I'm not going to blame those things on that, but what right. it did amplified it. And then I realized that my time frame was what was starting to scare me. Meaning like before I could, you know, even though I was using every day, I could wait until, I, until the evening or late mm -hmm. afternoon. But when it got to the point when, I could no longer, it was, it was had to be a morning thing and right. it was daily. That's when I realized like, I have a serious, like I have a problem. I need help. And then those that using and those substances, they take you down a dark road where you need, um, you know, your mental health starts to get bad. So mm -hmm. I was having, you know, suicidal ideation and very just bad mental health. And once it got to that point where it was, the timing and the using and the thoughts, that's when I had to finally ask for help. And I plunged my, I forced myself into recovery. I didn't, I did not, I was scared. It was the first three months were terrible. Like I don't, everyone was talking about this pink cloud and all I felt was a dark gray stormy mm. cloud for yeah. three months. And so it was really, really, really hard for me to stay the course. So you were experiencing, you know, physical withdrawal symptoms from not uh, using anymore? Yes. And um, for me also, it was more very mental of like, not, yeah, it was, it was physical. It was mental. It was hard. It was the hardest three months of my life to get through. And it was my therapist who challenged me to do, she said, let's try and do, cause, um, I have the reason that in my book I I brought in mental health is because I have borderline personality disorder. Mm -hmm. So that also played into the human behind the mask because when you have that, you wear a bunch of different masks and it's not really, you don't know which mask you're going to wake up wearing. So it's kind of out of your control, but you have to learn how to control it kind of thing. So anyway, um, Sorry, what was I saying? No, so we were talking about the physical withdrawal uh, and that the three months were incredibly tough on you. Um, let me let me just stop you there. You talked about borderline personality disorder. What is that? So it's when you have a split from like your true, your true feelings and everything. It starts at a young age. It's not something you're really 
uh, born with like bipolar disorder, you can be born with that borderline personality disorder is something that when your personality is split and it's a defense mechanism and you started at a young age and then it just kind of amplifies. So basically I was trying to, I believe my, I believe self-medicate over the years. And that was really me just trying to feel a sense of normalcy mm -hmm. whenever I, because I was unaware, I didn't know until, you know, I started recovery and everything that I have this. And it was, um, so once I figured that out, I have really been able to focus my therapy sessions and everything on targeting borderline personality disorder and getting healthier and better. But I do know, I know that that mental health issue played a huge role in my addiction because those different masks that I was wearing, I was, if it was uncomfortable, I was trying to mask those feelings yeah. and numb those feelings, feel normal again, because they, it's kind of like a roller coaster ride. Yeah. You're basically self-medicating is what you were doing. And that's for sure. And it's understandable. I mean, people do it all the time. They have depression, they have anxiety, they have whatever issue they're going through. Uh, they start drinking or using drugs to feel better. And I've, unfortunately, as you know, it confounds the problem. It makes it worse. It does. Um, and that's why I said face it and embrace it. Because for me, I wasn't facing my mental health issue. Right. Who I did wasn't. You turn I to was, for help? Was it your parents? Did you say, mom and dad, can you get me help? Or did you go to a healthcare provider on your own? So I went after the hurricane, I went to Miami and that's where I was just went downhill. Mm -hmm. And I checked out of the, this is right after the hurricane and the breakup. And I checked out of the hotel and after about three months of being there and just not being in my right mind, I checked out of the hotel and I drove to my parents' house. Mm. And that was my call. That was my cry for help. That's great. Um, I mean, it took strength to do that, but you did it and you got help. I mean, that's important too. And I, and I stayed there for months and yeah. I told them I was getting sober and I was serious about it. And I stayed with them and, um, me going there to them, that was my way of, um, holding myself accountable. Like I was looking to them and I didn't tell them at the time, but I was looking to them to be my accountability partners. Mm -hmm. Like if they knew I wanted to get sober, they knew I was trying this. I know nobody, there's nobody in the world that knows me better or loves me more than my parents. Yeah. So my parents were 100% supportive of the decision. They've seen me go through this ha struggle with this over the years. Mm -hmm. And um, they just did a great job of supporting me. But that was my cry for help was when I checked out of the hotel in Miami and I drove to their house and I made the conscientious decision decision at 31 years old to live with my parents for a couple of months and get on the right track. And that's right. when I got really into my really serious with therapy. I was doing one-on-one -on -one therapy once a week, group therapy once a week, going to AA meetings. I mean, I took it. I was really, really trying. That was those first three months that I struggled, but I, I made it through. Yeah. You more than tried, you succeeded, which is great as yes, well. Thank you. How long ago was it that you did the three month program in rehab? Oh, that's a good question. Like two or three years ago? Because Ian wasn't that long ago, right? No, no, it was, I did it when I, I went into rehab once I was already sober because oh, I needed, okay. I needed gotcha. extra help. Gotcha. Yeah. Gotcha. Yeah. When I came, when I left my parents' house and came back to Naples and I was by myself living in Naples, that's when I realized like, this is hard. Yeah. And I need extra help. I need right. to be, I need, I also need it to learn more because there's a lot of, um, you know, it knocks your confidence to say mm. you have an addiction or to admit that. And I need it to learn more because people were saying it's a disease. And the way I saw it was, well, no, I should be able to control this. Right. So I need it help. And I need it, um, you know, I needed people around me that understood what I was going through and I needed more than AA wasn't, it got to the point where that wasn't cutting it for me. Right. I needed that extra help. Um, and I had to ask for help. So I drove to the nearest rehab center. I told them I'm trying to get sober. I'm struggling. Like I got to get in a program. Yeah. Well, wonderful. Well, we're glad you did. We're glad it was helpful. Do you still go to counseling? Do you still need support and staying on the straight and narrow kind of thing? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Every maintenance week. is important, right? 
Yeah, it is yeah. because you know what I realized because there's been a couple of times where I've been like, okay, I'm, you know, I'm doing great. And then I'll kind of fall off on, not on the substance use, but on the, maybe I won't meet with my therapist or, you know, I'll be busy or I'll, mi or I'll miss like a lot of meetings. And then something in life happens that's challenging. And yeah. that's, when it's like, you realize like, I should have been put, I, you know, that makes you go back on track to putting the work in. But what I realized is if I can stay on track and putting the work in, you know, meeting with my sponsor once a week, doing my 12 step program, well, if I can stick to that, to that, I can stay on the right path. But as soon as I start to veer off and, you know, get a little comfortable, that's when something in life will happen where it'll be like, okay, I got to get back on the, on the path. Yeah. Well, great. Well, we're glad you're sticking with uh, your maintenance and you're sticking with the programs that are helping you. And uh, it seems like you're doing great. So wish you all trying success and continued success for sure. Let's talk about your book. What was it like writing your story? So I wasn't, when I started writing, I was never planning on writing a book. That was not my that was not what I was trying to do. It was, it just kind of happened. So when I was in recovery, I started writing that first three months that I was at my parents' house and I was really struggling a lot with um, accepting myself and admitting that I had a problem. And also like, how can I help others? Mm. Because that's the one thing is once you do get out of addiction or you start to come out of that. And, you know, the fog kind of clears, you realize how selfish you've been for how and for mm. how long. So I started to write and I started to, I would write whenever I had cravings and I would write about what the cravings were. Mm. And usually I struggle with um, body dysmorphia, like in e eating disorders. I've always had that issue, mental health, borderline personality disorder and addiction. Mm. And so you know, take your pick on what day or what I was going through mentally. Right. That's what I would sit down and I would start writing about. And um, I just realized uh, as I was writing and at first I was writing, but then I realized like, oh, this is, this rhymes and this goes together. And then I kind of started to tell a story and it became, I'm an artist naturally, and it became very a creative process for me to write and then to turn it into a poem. I'd never written poetry until I went into recovery. Mm -hmm. So um, what, and then that was my way of, of expressing and sharing. And then I was able to share my poems and stuff and I would start sharing them on Instagram and a lot of people were like reaching out to me like, oh my gosh, this is so helpful. Like I struggle with this too, blah, blah. And I realized how many people it was helping. Mm. And also just to like, because when you go on Instagram and you go on these social media accounts, every, you know, everything's, a lot of things are perfect, you know, not everyone. Right. But, and mine was kind of like, I kind of took a different angle where it was like, I'm flawed. I'm mm. a flawed human and it's okay. So right. I, so I had a lot of people reaching out to me and then that's when I kind of, I kept that encouraged me to keep writing. And also it was keeping me sober and giving, keeping me busy. Cause the number one thing for me, the first year of staying sober and staying on the course was I had to keep my mind occupied. I had to stay busy. Mm. So I would stay, I would stay, you know, I would stay busy in my writing and my free time because I work full time. So I would write, you know, whenever I had a craving and stuff. And then that just turned into very positive feedback. And then I decided um, after a while of putting all the writing, all the poems and stuff, I was making series. I was, you know, I was creating little projects out of it. Mm. I'd write a poem and then I model too. So I do a modeling like shoot that had to do with the theme. And then I do a painting that had to do with the theme. And then I pick a scripture out of the Bible that, so I was making these like little I, like multimedia stories mm. out of my poetry. And then that's when I decided eventually with all the feedback to, okay, maybe I should create this into a book and it'll be, and then, so actually this is, today is my one year sober. Wonderful. Congratulations. That was Thank good timing you. then that we're uh, here on your anniversary, right? I thought that was so yeah. cool. Yeah. So this is my one year sober today. Well, and I'll, I'll hoist a Heineken Zero in your honor. Yes, and, thank uh, you. <laughs> and uh, that's wonderful. That's wonderful. It, I know it's a struggle. Like I said, I don't drink anymore either. I know it's a struggle. 
Um, That's amazing. And uh, so it's great. And a year is a significant amount of time to have passed. So that's that's terrific. And your book is certainly going to be helpful to others. Who was the first person you gave the book to when you were done with it? Well, or did you give it out I, chapter by chapter to your mom and dad, that kind of thing? You know, it's possible or best friend or whatever. My mom. Yeah. My mom. Yeah. yeah. Um, my mom was the first one who read it and saw it. I, she read the actual, cause what happens is when you write a, I mean, it was new to me when you write a book, they send you a, um, like a preliminary copy, I guess, where it right. says on, it's like not the real copy, but it's basically just like a, here's what your book's going to look like kind of thing. Right. And my, mom, my mom was the first one who read that, um, right. read that over. Yeah. And, and she what was, was her and, take on it. Well, she went to school for journalism and okay. she's very intelligent. So when she was impressed by it and told me like that, she really, that she was like, wow, this is written really well. I knew, I knew it was written well because for my mom is very smart when it comes to grammar and all of that stuff. Mm -hmm. So for her to read it and be impressed and encouraging about it and supportive, it meant a lot. And that's when I knew that it was, it was going to definitely I mean, I knew it was going to touch lives. You know, right. that was the whole goal of me doing it was to help people that are struggling and not just in recovery and not just with addiction, but with mental health and body dysmorphia, because I know there's a lot of people out there that just suffer in silence. Right. And I do like think I, it goes hand in hand. Those three elements do for a lot of people, right? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Because that's what I realized is, you know, you asked about when I started or when I began using and when it picked up and all of that. And what I like when I was thinking that through in my head, it really picked up in college, but that's when my eating disorder picked up and right. the substances pick up because substance, when you're, you know, when your mind's altered, you're not hungry. Right. Right. So that's, you know, that's the confronting truth of when you have body dysmorphia or any sort of issue with your body or your self image, if you alter your mind, a, you, you're going to have more confidence. Like mm -hmm. at least I did when I, when my mind was altered, I thought I looked better than I did when I'm sober right. and it helped me with my food cravings. I wouldn't be as hungry. I wouldn't, you know, I wasn't, I wasn't thinking about, it would let my mind go where I, I wanted my mind to go. Right. Right. Yeah, it's it's interesting. I mean, it's such a, a bad spiral with uh, substances that, you know, you take a beer or whatever, or vodka shot or whatever your choice so poison is, and you just start making bad decisions from that point on, you know? Yeah, exactly. That's, that's part of the pyros. Through. It's like a downward spiral. It's not good at all. No. What do you hope readers take away from your book? I hope that people read it and when they read it that they feel self-love and self-acceptance mm. um to have somebody write about flaws and confronting vulnerable topics and then to read it i feel like i want people to be comfortable in their own skin and to embrace themselves as they are because that's really what i was running from all those years i think with my addiction was not having self-love yeah yeah and not accepting myself because when you accept yourself and you love yourself you don't want to harm yourself right and, and it's funny because obviously you're a very attractive person and you would say some people say well what does she have to not love herself about but it doesn't really correlate to reality you know mm -hmm. someone who is you know objectively maybe not so good looking can have great self-esteem and someone who's great looking can have low self-esteem. So it's kind of a, a riddle and a puzzle within a maze sometimes yeah. trying to and figure this stuff out, right? That's And that's exactly why I said human behind the mask, because, you know, even right now I have makeup on, like, you know, right. there's that we do and, and we might look a certain way or appear a certain way, but what mask are we, you know, what mask are we wearing? And is that really, you know, if you look at me and yeah, people might think what, what's wrong with her, you know, right. what she is, you know, what would she be upset about? And it's right. like, well, it's not about that because everyone has different 
men, you know, yeah, you have emotional baggage that they have, right? Yes, yeah. different. And what it is, is it's just different trauma and unresolved things that in that happen in life. And if you don't resolve them and face them, then they just end up, you know, it's like you can only sweep so much under the rug before it starts to show. Absolutely. Very, very true. And I'm wearing makeup also, if that makes you feel better. <laughs> It looks yeah. great. <laughs> great. Thanks. Um, part of your book is poetry. Part of your book's personal insights. Part of your book is scripture. Is there a favorite piece of poetry that you wrote that like is kind of like the one like, ah, oh, this kind of really reminds me of a moment or something? Probably for me, the, the one that when I think of the book and I think of like the one that just hits, hits me the hardest is um, it's called Betty Ford. And mm. that's the rehab center I went to. Okay. And that one is very raw, very just, you know, there's a cuss word in there. And it just, that was my most authentic, like very authentic writing. And that one was the realest because that was, I'll never forget writing that. It was when I hit my six months sober. Mm. And that was when my um, therapist had challenged me, why don't you just try and get rid of substance for six months so we can get this BPD under control? Mm -hmm. And then if you want to go back to it, you go, you know, so I had hit that six months and that's when I wanted, I was like, oh man, like mm -hmm. I want it to go back, but I knew it was the wrong decision. So Betty Ford is about, I didn't mention the first time I went into a rehab program, which was back in 2001 or 2002. That was about, so Betty Ford is about the first time that I relapsed after the first rehab. Gotcha. And, and so, that's normal with everything in life, no matter what your journey is. It's not like this. It's like yes. this. You know? So I wrote that on my six months because I wanted to relapse and I knew it wasn't the right thing to do. So instead of relapsing, I just wrote about the first time that I did relapse after rehab. And then that way that helped me stay the course. Awesome. Awesome. That's great. Well, I think this will be powerful stuff for people to read. When I was a kid growing up, when we were about 13 years old, we all had to read a book called Go Ask Alice, which was uh -huh. the diary of a, of a girl who was a user. Wow. And it was the intent of it was to scare us straight. And then it became yeah. a movie and everything. If you ask your parents about it, they'll say, oh yeah, we read that. Oh um, my God. Okay, this yeah, is obviously a 2024 take on that. Uh, and it's a lot more because, you know, it is kind of uh, multimedia with your artwork oh, and yeah. with your poems and the scripture that you include. So I think you really are shining a great beacon of light um, on the issue and helping people find their way in the dark. So uh, yeah. very proud of you. Very happy we were here today with you on the one year anniversary. If you want to come back when you're two years sober. And every year thereafter, that's great. We'll do it until uh, you're 99. How does that sound? <laughs> I would love that. Okay, sounds great. The name of the book is Human Behind the Mask. It is not just a memoir. It is a real life story by Carly Reed. It is a beacon of hope. It chronicles her battles with addiction and body dysmorphia and mental health challenges, but it has a happy ending. You see Carly today, one year sober. She's doing great. And this book will help you no matter what your challenge is. It might not be exactly like hers, but there might be something like hers. And I think this story will have great impact on you. Carly, thank you so much for joining us here today on Spotlight. Thank you so much for having me. I really enjoyed this experience and I really hope that whoever picks up the book, um, you know, gains some sort of power. Absolutely, I think it's very empowering and it's highly recommended. And again, the links are below this interview. To the folks at home, I'm Logan Crawford, thanking you for your time this time. Until next time on Spotlight. Visit www.greatwritersmedia.com. Email us at info at greatwritersmedia.com. Call us at 877-600-5469. Subscribe now.